All right. So this is going to be a very simple talk, very easy. I hope uh, it won't bother, and I'll, I'll try to finish it well in time. There's only one slide, maybe two, which are difficult to follow. I'll try to explain them properly. But uh, this is uh, our experience of running Time Machine at LBNL. And the technology I'm talking today is from 2005. Hasn't changed much, uh, little bit improvements. So the problem came because uh, we wanted full packet capture. And generally, when do you want full packet capture? When bro logs are not sufficient, there is this O oh moment. And you have, this is your last resort to go to. There is like nothing more left out there. So we wanted, uh, uh, in our local like discussion within the team, what, uh, we came up with like, what is the criteria? What is our minimum requirement? And that was stability. Can I have a high level of confidence when I go to a system look, to look at the packet traces? It's there. So we went and actually got Solera Box uh, and this as well. Uh, can't. We, we actually tried sincerely, just didn't work for us. So this was our uh, uh, requirement. Short, uh, so actually, we, LBNL does 8 to 10 terabytes of uh, traffic per day. Uh, so with Solera Box or uh, uh, NDIS, we could do maximum three uh, days of traffic capture. And then you have to buy their own proprietary storage. And then this whole bells and whistles come up. It was just too expensive. It was so the searches were very slow. The, I had experiences where I said, OK, I'm going to search this uh, uh, slash 24, or I'm going to search like this 1,500 IP addresses. And they are like, no, you can't do that. I said, OK, what can I do? So he's like, you can search a port. So I said, OK, let me search this port for 30 days or three days. That froze too. So it's, there were all these, like, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. You can only do this little bit. So with Solera, there were a lot of uh, widgets on the screen. So I enabled all of them. It would show you IP6, or this, that, all kinds of uh, awesome stuff. But when I enabled everything, it actually froze. The box would not do anything. So there were all this. And we sincerely tried. They sincerely tried. Didn't work out. So they had weak analytics, very limited feature. And that's where we said, OK, let's try to come up with. Uh, and this was our requirement plan, six months of retention. Can we do six months of traffic? Can we do it cheap? We don't, we, LBNL uh, is a place for uh, TCP dump, LibPCAP. So it's like we don't want a proprietary data format. We want open data format. Can we do it in LibPCAP format? Easy and fast to search. And when bro logs are not sufficient, can we actually rely on something else, which is very rare, but uh, it becomes crucial. So here's little background. I mean, uh, credit goes to these people. There are so many other people who wrote Time Machine, but I know of these two. Uh, because uh, whenever there is a problem, right now I'm talking to Gregor. And these guys are from Technical University Berlin uh, or Munich. And then I think, Robin, are you from the same? So Robin's university. And I suppose Bernhard's too. So not sure. But this was a paper. If you want to read more about Time Machine, it's a 2005 publication. You should check this out. So what is the Time Machine? Like, wow, how is it different? How is it so good? This is the killer feature. It has a, something called connection cutoff. There is this packet stream going on. You decide, OK, this is where this is how much of data I want to see. And then this is what I don't care about. So the cutoffs are defined per port, per protocol. It actually has additional features like creating indexes so that you can actually go to indexes. You can search through indexes. And then uh, there's a lot of research in that paper and uh, supplement papers where uh, they actually try to prove that the most interesting stuff is in first end bytes. And then there is this long, huge tail. That's where all the big uh, traffic is. But generally, it's not interesting. And then for our attack or security related stuff, like if I'm curious about, let's go see if we can find that particular exploit which was downloaded. There's no way that exploit is currently 2 gig in size. So, so that's kind of working assumption. So here is a config example. Like Time Machine, you can create different buckets. So uh, we created one bucket called SMTP. And then you can have a, a lip pick up or TCP dump like filter. You can say, OK, the SMTP uh, listen for like anything, any traffic on 25 or 587 goes there. Decide upon a cutoff. Uh, 
limit for this particular bucket, 25 meg. That's because Google allows 25 megs of attachment size for LBNL. Uh, you can have an encrypted bucket. All the encrypted traffic can go there. Encrypted traffic already troublesome. You can't really see much into it. So if you want the initial little chunks of the data, so cutoff is 500K. The file size is how much is going to be the bucket uh, on the disk before it rotates to the next file. So it's pretty simple, pretty elegant, very well done. So our goal was to get six months of full packet capture. And that time, we had a 50 terabyte constraint. So we started doing is like, OK, let's start tuning time machine. Let's have 20 megabyte capture, uh, cutoff for HTTP, 25 for SMTP, everything else is 20. So this is the number we started getting, which was actually 950 gigabytes uh, per day. So if we go for six months, we need 171 terabytes of storage. Our goal was 50. And then, but check, still check one thing out. Like uh, we are doing eight to 10 terabytes a day, reduced to 950 gigabytes. So let's go with the next version. Uh, change the captures, came down to 700, but still is 126 terabytes. It doesn't work for us. Let's optimize more. Let's create more number of buckets. So we actually said, uh, here is the number of buckets. Here is much more fine tuning. Uh, came to 315 gigabytes, which actually is roughly uh, our goal. So, uh, but now the question is like everybody is pretty much, this is not full packet capture. You are only getting chunks of data. You are not getting full packet capture. And that's what I think uh, all the commercial vendors are trying to do. They are trying to get everything out there. So, yeah, we are not. And this is the heavy slide, which actually is the ground truth. But uh, the thing is, this is one day of data. And I'll try to explain the numbers here. If you have questions, feel free to interrupt me. So what the first column shows is all the number of unique connections we see in all these different buckets per day. So uh, the buckets are protocols as well as uh, actually services. So for example, UDP bucket, we actually see 1.6 million connections. And then we decided that uh, the threshold, cutoff threshold for UDP is going to be 5 megs, or ICMP is going to be 64K, SMTP is 25 megs. So these actually show. So this number in, in the numbers in this column is actually how many connections are uh, less than particular threshold and how many con connections are greater than the threshold. So comes out in UDP that of 1.6 million, there are 705 connections, which actually are more than 5 megabyte in size. So when I see 705 connections, I actually have still have 5 megabyte of the traffic for those connections, just that the big chunk of traffic is not there. And this shows, uh, actually, like if I would have done math right, I would have just done 99.99. But it, it's just good to have big number after there. So it <laughs> seems more accurate, right? So I left it that way. But yeah, you, I mean, with this particular setup, we actually have 99.9% uh, .9 coverage. And that's, f I think, uh, acceptable. So what it does is, I'm sorry? Did you ever go back and find out what the stuff Yeah, I did. But I don't remember right now, actually. <laughs> So uh, this actually, I, I will I, I will go back and see. And this talk is from last year. So, but I wanted to like just throw this idea. Uh, I will check again and I will let you know. So, uh, I did that for this. I did for this. This one I remember. Uh, so the number actually went from 95 gigs to 8.5 gigs. So this is pretty much. Uh, the win in time machine. So here are uh, other ones. So this one was a big zone transfer. So that's why there is one connection uh, of 1.8 million. Basically, you get one, which is a big, huge zone transfer going on. But the interesting thing, thing here is that the capture size was 8.5 gigabyte, and the actual traffic on wire was 7.8. So I actually tried to verify why would this happen. So my first theory was that because you are storing 18 million packets, uh, in libpcap format, and then there is like uh, 16 bytes per header for every per captured. Uh, that's why it would be. But that's not the case. When I was actually calculating the numbers, Bro actually gives you two two sizes of the traffic. One of them is including the header. Another is only the TCP uh, header onwards size. So that's what it actually adds up to. So, but here is the big win stuff. Encrypted 1.7 terabytes actually re gets reduced to 110 gigabytes. 2.8 terabytes actually gets reduced to 140. So this is, uh, and then all bucket is basically catch all. If it doesn't fall in any of the filter, go for like it goes in all bucket. So does this make sense? 
Now, there is still a problem in this chart. This, this is pretty good. Like, uh, I think except for encrypted, when there is 95% capture, uh, rest of them is pretty high numbers. The thing is, I did, only f uh, I did this only for one day. I should be doing it for like 30 days, and then it will be scientifically very much accurate. But I don't see if, I do, if there is a math problem. Otherwise, it should be an expected behavior. So, so these are all the good. Uh, so far, there was good things. Now I'll just talk about all the bad things in, in the time machine, all the shortcomings. This is a grad student project, but it is very high, like highly reliable, very production process. So the first is actually to defic This is what you would see in the time machine, and it's really difficult to find out what is the right file. So either you actually rely on like, okay, here is the timestamp. This this is when we had the notice. Let's go to the, it's HTTP. So let's go and find this file and then do. So there is some additional workaround you have to come up with. So uh, one workaround which we came up with was like create a virtual file system. And what this did is actually uh, it says uh, like uh, I think it's 19th of October and uh, uh, I want encrypted. Uh, bucket and this is the timestamp, this is the time. So you can actually, based on the timestamp, you can go and then this particular virtual file system will find the right file for you and come back. So these are little experiments which we have been doing. Now there is another thing, Time Machine has indexes. It has four kinds of indexes. Uh, they are supposed to go search the packet captures real, really fast and give you uh, results as soon as possible. The problem with indexes is they are not persistent. So if you stop Time Machine, restart Time Machine, indexes don't get read back from the disk. They, like Time Machine forgets about what happened. It's like, okay, there is new index, there is new beginning. So you have to do, and then, that time, this was uh, not doing IPv6, but that's wrong. S this Friday, uh, the IPv6 support got completed. It still is not finalized because I, I need Seth and Robin to actually look at it, and then they will critique it and then figure out if everything is accurate or not. But I have been running the IPv6 support at the lab for at least three, four weeks now. It has been pretty stable. It has been running very well. There are issues like indexes. If you enable indexes with v6, the load levels go to 70 or 80 or 100 percent of the CPU. So we need to figure out why that is happening. The student was sharp but not sharp enough. So, <laughs> so, so uh, here is the another shortcoming. The interface is basic. It's literally TCP dump dash r. So the uh, but we would do big searches, like when Morto worm hit, we had to do big searches. Alien worm hit, we had to do big searches. So like if uh, I went for like three months of all the data, everything for a class uh, C address uh, space, and then that took 20 hours to finish. But most of the time, the searches actually are a minute or less than that. And you can actually do GNU parallel, and then you can parallelize the search to which runs really fast too. It does not have any fancy uh, analytics. There is no GUI. There is nothing like gadgets or graphs or diagrams. You can't, I mean, it's just raw disk LS output. So, but it does have one very strong feature. It, has, it comes with an API support. And the way we use it is that we actually have Bro talk to the time machine. So we, when Bro sees an alert, it's worthy of uh, getting a PCAP. Bro would go talk to time machine, run a uh, search, and actually extract the PCAP for you already. So when you're looking at the notices, you already have a PCAP ready for you extracted. So that works. Now, uh, there are performance issues. Like uh, there was a lot of winning uh, tweaking which we needed to do. Like if you have a 50 terabyte disk, then how would the disk optimizations work? Are, are there going to be like file system issues? So there were all these little. I'm just going to skip that. So. Uh, the one question actually somebody asked us was like, can I can it do a full uh, line rate at 10 gig? Uh, and we really don't know. I mean, this is the traffic which uh, uh, we are seeing at the lab. I should actually so, uh, but like this is uh, about uh, two gig limit. So this is an average traffic on that particular day with the spikes going up to like. Uh, Five or seven gigs. So we need. We we don't know. Like if we have fully saturated ten gig, I don't think we can sustain. But uh, at two three gigs sustain level, it works pretty well. Is it dropping packets? Yes, it does drop packets. It drops drops packets like. Uh, but this graph is again deceptive. Look at the minimum level. It's ninety eight percent here. So when you see these numbers, it's like ninety nine percent or somewhere in chunk of like near hundred percent. And there is two hundred percent because that's how access. Uh, Excel generated this graph. But the packet drops are there. <laughs> see, see here, 100 and 100. So, 
But, uh, and this is data from October uh, last year. So the thing is, uh, it does drop packet, but I think this is a manageable level of packet dropping, or at least for our purposes it is. So here's another graph, like again, is it dropping packets? So I said, okay, I'm gonna put a graph of all the traffic being uh, out there, and then this is the drop. This is a log scale again. So when you see is that there is like 1,000, this is 1,000 count, 10,000 count, and then this is actually a billion count. So generally, when you see droppings, the packet drops, they are actually at around 10,000 packets, if, uh, in chunks of 10,000 or so, getting dropped out of a billion packets which are being seen at that time. So this is actually a graph from yesterday. Again, yesterday, like I think in the daytime, there was about two gigs of traffic here. There were spikes going on. And then this little thing, if you can see, is the packet drops. And yesterday, I had to like thrice check the data uh, and that was because packet drops were really less yesterday, and I'm not sure why was the why that was the case. So there's this little spike here, and then there's this one spike here. But uh, I think this is not quite uh, ready. So I, again, there's this log scale. It shows that this is basically the packet drops from yesterday's data, about 1,000 to 10,000 level. Uh, and then there is this one little big spike, which actually goes to 100,000. Oh, no, actually a million. So, yeah, that, that is a tough thing when you show data with log scale. But uh, uh, another question somebody asked was, like, is disk I.O. a bottleneck? So uh, as I said, 50 terabytes of file system management and all those things actually need, need tweaking. It needs some expertise. It needs things. But then uh, I think uh, what we figured out was that disk I.O. doesn't actually affect it. It's the number of more spindles you have on the disk is better. But then we s thought of doing some experiments like, OK, how about have a big SSD? Let uh, the packets get written on the SSD, and then we move the packets to a bigger storage later. How would that work out? The experiment hasn't been done yet, but that's one of the things which we have to do. So. Uh, OK, again, same thing. Uh, like, how long does a query take? And are we there talking about five seconds, a minute, 20 hours? So uh, again, if you use GNU parallels, uh, uh, like, OK, so here's the number. The search for 24 uh, four hour data was roughly 10 minutes or less than 10 minutes. So uh, th this one was a slash 24, uh, about uh, 15,000 files uh, for all the data which we had, about 19 and a half hours. And then this API really works very well. You can actually. Uh, tie it with bro, you can tie it with your other sensors, you can tie it with your other command line tools. Any alert gets generated, triggers connection with time machine, talks and extracts the data out. So, uh, okay, so here is a demo I would like to show, and uh, you won't be disappointed about this one. So, so this is actually, uh, no, okay. <coughs> So this is a, you know, an instance of Time Machine at the lab. So and this is actually pretty much real-time traffic. Right now, it's uh, in California, it's 304. And so, so this is IPv6 traffic in the class file. So this, this is actually the stable time machine with IPv6, and guys, look at it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so but uh, uh, actual demo is actually uh, this thing here. So we had a VoIP incident, and uh, thanks, Vlad, for writing the VoIP analyzer, because that would really help. So what happened at the lab is uh, they were trying to get new VoIP equipment. So uh, well, there is a transition, so there is this old equipment. I'm going to just put a password which is easily guessable. So uh, there is a wipe, wipe scan happens. Uh, uh, the fellow changed the password around 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening. The scan happens, the, machine, the system gets owned, and uh, around midnight or so, they actually compromised the uh, system, and then they started to figure out to make phone calls. So uh, by, uh, I think, 3 o'clock in the night, AT&T flagged us, and then we actually went and started taking control of the things. So we said, OK, this is actually an incident we don't know much about. Well, there is no VoIP analyzer at that point of time. Can we go to Time Machine? Can we actually gather the data from it? So this is what Time Machine actually written. I won't play all of them, but. Uh,
this is shit. Yeah, that's shit. Hello? Hello? And then, uh, if you see this one. So what's happening here is that uh, the guys who actually compromised the system were actually making calls or trying to route the calls. And it's a typical environment. You see this Middle Eastern music. So we actually figured out that this was actually from Egypt. And they, so they are listening to their music. They are actually talking about amongst each other. And then they are making these calls. So that hello accent was a British accent. So they actually are making calls everywhere around, trying to figure things out. So we went. So the, 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 the thing here, what I wanted to show is that, OK, uh, there, are, there is this audio stuff. Uh, we had 5 megabyte UDP cutoff. We could still go to Time Machine, retrieve these uh, phone calls, and we could actually get back. So this, a, even though it's like a grad project, it's actually now being maintained, has not been maintained for a while. It has, but it's, it's re reliable. It actually works pretty well overall. So and that's, that's all I had to sh say. Any questions or comments? Yes. I think it'd be interesting to use the response side from yesterday. Like, what do you do with a bro when a notice or something fires and talk to Time Machine and say, you know, don't truncate me now because I've got an alert associated with it? Oh, actually, that's a good idea. We, we should try that out. I think that that is something. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good question. No, we'll, I, 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 I don't know the answer, but I think that's something we can try. Cutoff. Oh, sorry. You you can change the cutoff in Time Machine dynamically so that if Bro did see something and says I want more of this, you can actually tell it to remove the cutoff for that connection. And there somewhere in the Git repository, I just pushed out some stuff I'd been working on a while ago for a Time Machine framework where it actually improves the interface so Bro can really easily talk to Time Machine. And, and I think that was one of the things where you just called a function and it would go out and say don't kill this connection. So. Yeah, I, actually, the thing with t t the thing with time machine is uh, uh, w like indexes are not persistent, or uh, the load level is high when we got the IPv6 support in there, or some other things uh, there. But overall, when it was designed, it's actually designed really well. Uh, it has uh, auto API, it has index uh, support in there. It actually has a so it works. It's a multi-threaded application. So it doesn't matter like how much traffic is coming. The capture thread gets the highest priority. So it tries to not drop the packet as much as possible. So so it it's a pretty beautiful software written there. So it has a lot of features overall. So yeah. Um, are you guys using the Git uh, repository version of it, or do you guys have your own version of it that you've? Tweaked with the IPv6? No, no, no. Oh, so, so there are right now two different versions. Uh, the production time machine at LBNL is repository version. If you go to bro.org, get repo, get the clone of the time machine git, that's what we are running. And I think Seth made it really easy to install and uh, deploy. So it's literally download.configure, make, make, install, go to the conf file, and then just uh, run the conf file. As actually, it's like time machine dash C and the corn file, and it, it should not take more than 30 seconds to get. Now, I have another parallel branch which actually has v6 support. Uh, I just want it to be vetted by the, these guys and then figure out, like, is it acceptable enough, and then actually push it forward. So. I just thought about my question might be moot, but so you're not saving the actual indexes to disk or anything, so if time machine stops, you can't leverage the index from three days ago or something like that anymore? So if time machine, so indexes get written to the disk. Okay. And uh, if the time machine process started, it, it, it actually has indexes write, written to the disk. The process continues. You can query the indexes. If you kill that time machine, uh, then whatever indexes are on the disk won't actually be applicable in the next instance of time machine. But while that particular instance is running, all the indexes are actually active. So time machine, when you restart time machine, it doesn't actually read what's on the disk. and uh, uh, understands it. So. So do you don't have any idea how much disk space you're losing 
to your index files? I actually, I can show you that quickly. Let's see. So this is actually the production time machine at the lab. And uh, so it's about 1.1 terabytes of indexes uh, which we have in place there. And, uh, but what we did here is. Uh, but that's 1.1 terabytes for how much traffic? Oh, for, uh, I think the indexes start uh, is, uh, let's see. So we have indexes from. Uh, Stack, let's see, I don't think it's. April 2 onwards. So, but it's uh, all the traffic which we have in place. So I think right now, currently, we are, have a total, if you look here, uh, so we have 79 terabytes of storage uh, 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 going on and what we have done is we have a mechanism where we keep uh, about two terabytes on and then there's this uh, the disk is filled at 97 percent and there's a, a cron which keeps running and keeps clean, clean, cleaning old data but so basically 1.1 terabytes of index for 79 terabytes of data and the process has been running for i think 653 hours or something and that results in uh, uh, basically indexes being applicable. The question is right now, like, do we use index? We don't use index. I think Bro goes and talks to Time Machine. Bro uses index of the Time Machine. All of us are in habit of using GNU Parallel and just extracting on our own. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Ashish? So, uh, thank you so much, and thanks for listening. Yeah.